I will tell you a little bit about self-organizing smart microgrids and what we are doing in this area. So, basically, uh, research, uh, uh, our research goes in the area of self-organizing systems, engineering self-organizing systems, and smart microgrids. And in particular, currently, we are building up a smart microgrid lab. So, I will tell you briefly about this four areas here. So what is a self-organizing system? Uh, probably the easiest way to explain it is to take the example from Christian Petschtetter uh, on the fish swarm. So there are swarm fish, actually they exist as they are in nature, which are fish that always go together in a swarm. And they live in a swarm and the advantage of being in a swarm is that they can easier detect food. Like if there are food sources in the environment and one fish spots the food source, it goes there and somehow the others can follow this fish. And the swarm fish, they have quite simple behavior in order uh, to live in the swarm. So all what they have to do is more or less swim there where other fishes are, other fish are. So they go there. Uh, they also should avoid coming too close. So they should keep like uh, a given distance to the next fish. So if this one comes too close, this one should move a little bit in order to keep the distance. Uh, they are attracted by food and they try to avoid predators. It's good that it is this way around because otherwise evolution would uh, quickly kill them. So, giving these simple rules, how does this work? Uh, what properties do we have? One thing is that this swarm is able to adapt to situations. So like if there is uh, a predator fish coming this way, these who spot the predator first, they are moving away from the predator and giving the others some pressure also to move. So those fish move, also they haven't seen the reason for the movement. They just move because this fish is moving and this fish is moving. So they can earlier go away from the, from the predator, could be a shark or something, and this way they can uh, avoid being all caught. Of course, sometimes it happens that there is one unlucky fish that gets caught. So what happens if one fish gets caught and the others get away? Actually, the swarm is still operable. So there is no significant chance, uh, cha uh, change because uh, this is a, a fully distributed system. So you don't have a leader fish, you don't have a, a king fish or something. So there is, you can take any fish away and still the system works. It also works if you increase the number of fish in the swarm also by a large amount. So this system will behave and operate uh, in the same way as the small one will. And these are properties that are quite attractive. So when we think of, of modern systems, uh, we have a lot of components with more and more components and we might want to add some components at some time. Uh, we want the system still to be operable. And if we have a centralized system where we have one guy in charge to control everything, it becomes more and more complicated to uh, keep up the order. But if you have a self-organizing system, uh, it will work this way that we can increase it and uh, the control will be distributed and still be able to perform a coordinated action. And this is the basic idea of self-organization. So that's why I don't go for uh, definitions here or something, just uh, take this picture. And one thing that is also very attractive is that actually the rule for the single fish, they, they were not complicated. So we had uh, just a need for local observations. So the sensors of a single fish, they don't need to be very sophisticated. You don't need, uh, one single fish doesn't need to see everything. Uh, if the food source is spotted by some other fish and not by this one, this one still gets the food. So we, have, we can use uh, simple sensors, we can use 
uh, reduced number of sensors, we can uh, observe, observe our environment only locally. It still works. So this is quite an interesting property, which means that we can use cheap components. Uh, there are interaction with other fish, but they are quite simple because it was just, uh, if you see another fish, go closer, but not too close. That's it. So this is a very simple rule, easy to implement. There is no centralized control, and yeah, as I said before, it's simple. So implementing these rules uh, would be quite easy. And if you imagine uh, some uh, technical system where we have a similar model, where we have some agents that interact with each other, if we have interactions like this, this, this could be easily implemented and it would be also easy to uh, uh, buy the sensors for this agent because this agent doesn't need the most excellent sensors or to see everything. So this is good. Out of this, we get our overall system, like in the fish example, it's the fish school. And here we have complex behavior. And here we have this robustness, adaptiveness, and scalability, as we, said, uh, as we have seen in the slide before. So this is a nice thing. So from simple rules, by adding many of these agents, many of these components, we get the uh, behavior we want. And this is what makes self-organizing systems attractive for uh, technical systems. Wherever you have a lot of components, a lot of complexity, this might be a good approach. Now, when you want to engineer such a, su such a system, so you want to build one, there is one problem that, uh, how do you get to these simple rules? Because actually, it's not that easy to look at a system, look at the system behavior you want, and then just say, uh, this is done by exactly these rules. Also, the rules to be described are very simple. It's very hard to find them. And in two research projects, we looked at that question. And uh, we came up with a method for engineering self-organizing systems by using evolution. And our evolutionary approach uh, works in a way that we simulate our target system as kind of a playground, as a kind of a test system. And then uh, here we define the agents. And then we evolve the behavior for the agents in order to do what the oral system should do. For this, we have to define a fitness function. So when we run a simulation, we need to know how close are we to the intended behavior. This fitness function gives some feedback. And then an evolutionary, evolutionary algorithm sorts out the better solutions, gets rid of the worse solutions, and out of the better solutions, new solutions are created, which hopefully come closer to the intended behavior. So basically, this evolutionary, uh, evolutionary algorithm is now a process during which we get our local rules more, more closer uh, to emerge a behavior we want for the oral system. So basically, what do we get? We have an agent, and within this agent, we have a control system that controls the actions of the agent. And the agent usually relies on some input function. These are typical sensors. So these are the, the fish example. This would be the sensors telling the agent, here is food, or here is a predator, or here is just some other uh, fish close to it. And we have an output for the agent, and this is the action. It tells the agent to go to some direction, in this case. So in the fish example, it's just motion, or uh, could be any kind of behavior, depending on what you're modeling. And we want to have this algorithm. So in order to get this algorithm, uh, we define these control systems, this brain of the agent, in a way that it is evolvable. What does evolvable mean? Evolvable means that we uh, can, can define a mutation operation on it. Mutation means I change a little bit of the brain, just randomly, and it still has a similar behavior, 
might be a little bit better, might be a little bit worse. So by mutation, I can do the following. I have one solution for this. I jiggle it a little bit. I look again if the solution got better or worse. If it got better, I keep it. If it got worse, I remove it. So this is the mutation operation. The other thing would be recombination. Recombination means that I have two parents, father and a mother. Both have quite good traits, good behavior. And I'm mixing both of them into uh, one child. And then I'm testing the child. And this is basically how, uh, what we need to run this evolution algorithm. And currently, as a model for this control system, so you can imagine, uh, usually if you implement some, some control algorithm, you implement it in like some programming language, like in C or C++, or even if you go for Java, uh, in the control system, it, it doesn't, uh, it's very difficult to specify mutation here. How would you mut mutate a C program? Just changing one uh, ASCII character in the source code, that won't work. That will immediately cause your program not to compile anymore. So this is very hard to define for uh, standard algorithms in, in standard programming languages. So instead what we are using is, uh, one thing we were very successful with was artificial neural networks. So we have currently uh, implemented systems with multi-layer artificial neural networks and with fully meshed recursive neural networks. And uh, also recently, uh, the post is not the, we have uh, implementation of a finite state machine according to the Mealy model, uh, which can also be evolved, mutated, and recombined. And in order to do this, it's a lot of effort to implement. First you need the simulation, and then you need to implement the evolutionary algorithm, and then you need to model the agents, and then you have to decide what kind of representation uh, you want to use. So imagine applying this for every problem you have and then changing something, this would cause a lot of effort. You would have like one or two years, effort, um, uh, person years in effort implementation every time you want to uh, apply this approach to some self-organizing system. So therefore, uh, we have elaborated a tool which is providing uh, more or less the modules for most of the things that are needed. And all what is left for you is to define the problem. So the tool's name is Framework for Evolutionary Design, Frevo. And it's a modular Java tool. And Frevo defines components, which can be also extended or, or changed, for the representation of the controller. So this is this kind of brain. So you can select different representations for the specification of the problem and uh, for the optimizing algorithm, basically the evolutionary algorithm. So this is already in the Frevo framework. So we have the optimization method here. So basically here we have this with this mutation and recombination and the iteration. This is here represented in green. We have different candidate representations like a finite state machine, an artificial neural network. So this is implemented, you can use it as a module. And then you have to define your problem here and set the Frevo framework to run and it starts to evolve, generates solutions, looks uh, through the better solutions, evolve them and gets them better. And the advantage is if you start with using an artificial neural network and evolve something and then you think, okay, probably this was not the, uh, the best approach. I should do it differently. Probably finite state machines would have been better. Uh, what would be the effort to change this? So in Frevo there is a, a user interface. You can just switch from this to this, hit the run button again, and you get the solution for the different representation. So how scalable is this? Because scalability is an important property, as you put it in your talk. This is mainly uh, problem dependent. So if you evolve the fish example, mm -hmm. then you get a solution which works for 10 fish as well as for 100 fish, or for 1,000 fish. But of course, if you define some problems very specific, where the, the uh, evolved solution only works for like 100 nodes, 
it can happen that it doesn't work for a thousand nodes, or it still works for a thousand nodes, but not uh, as well. So this really depends on the problem. So this scalability property is a general property of self-organizing systems, but of course it's not uh, given in, in all cases. This is open source, yeah. This, this framework uh, tool is open source and you can download it and uh, at framework I will publish the, the URL later. And you can use it, you can model your own problems and play with it. Yeah. So how do we get a problem into Fravor? So basically we need some simulation of the problem or something that gets the, uh, that connects to the agents, lets the agent interact in this virtual world where the, the agent uh, should perform and then gives some feedback. So uh, one critical part is to design this interface uh, for the agent, so the input and the output connections. So for example, for one game, uh, we gave it an input of a round before what the others played so, and uh, another input was how well the agent performed in the last round and then the agent could decide what to do in the next round. Uh, important is that the simulation gives back a fitness value to Frevo. So we have here this interface we have here the, the simulation, and the simulation should give back the fitna, fitness. So this simulation run with these agents performed like whatever value you want to use. Yeah, and basically with this you are done. So you have this interface, you have this fitness, and then you can start it right away. And uh, at the Fravor source code page, which is this address, there is a tutorial for implementing a new problem. So in this simple tutorial, you make your own new problem. Uh, I think within less than half an hour, you can get it in and get it to run and evolve something with it. So this was now about engineering self-organizing systems and one way to do it and one nice tool which you all could use if you have uh, the need for it, for doing it. What have we done so far with it? We have different things. One thing, we evolved the uh, cooperative behavior for simulated robot soccer. So there is a nice YouTube video of this uh, online where you see how the, the players interact with each other in order to play robot soccer. This is more kind of a game, but it's, uh, it's very interesting to, to uh, see how the mechanisms of the evolution worked here well in order to evolve the, the behavior. Another thing was we studied uh, cooperative behavior and how cooperative behavior evolves in a system of uh, rational agents in an economic uh, environment. So just one thing here was uh, that the system, in order to have cooperation working, there needs to be some, some greater revenue for uh, cooperation, some synergy effect in order to get it. And what we have shown here was that uh, it's difficult to see the scale, but this, like a, a, this is like a very long time. And even if cooperation pays off, it takes quite some long time until the whole system comes to a state where most of the agents cooperate. When they cooperate, they get uh, more out of the system. And they get more money, they earn more money. And here, so this is a different scale. So this is like this time frame in length. Here we removed this synergy effect. So it's still the case that the cooperation gives more re revenue than the non-cooperation. But now, uh, if somebody would defect and be egoistic, then it would get more out of it than the others. And we see here that here this was stable, so it kept at this level. But once we removed the synergy effect, even if the system was already in cooperation mode, it quickly dropped down. Much quicker than it took to establish it. 
So to learn for this is, in order to establish cooperation, needs a lot of effort. It needs uh, some incentive to get it. But once you move the incentive, it drops down very quickly. So it's easier to destroy such cooperative systems than to get them. Of course, this is only valid for this special model, but I still think it's an interesting lesson for life. Uh, another thing we did was we evolved an algorithm for coordinating robots, especially flying drones, to cover some area and to do some search mis mi mission. So different kinds of things. One other thing was a, a case study for self-organizing cellular automata patterns. So you're not really limited by the, by the applications uh, for this tool. But uh, one of the last things we did, and probably for this workshop the most interesting, was uh, to evolve the consumer behavior in a real-time energy market. So this is now related to the smart grid. So we have some consumers. You can imagine that as houses or households. And currently, we have a standard price for electricity. So you, neg you negotiate your contract, and then you get more or less your standard price. And actually, in creation of the energy, there is, uh, it's not so easy to, to generate almost the amount of energy that it's used. So sometimes it's more expensive to give the consumer the energy that is needed, especially uh, when there is more demand than locally can be provided, like in one country. Then one country has to buy energy from another country, or you have to uh, get some power plant running, which is usually very expensive to produce, like if you would use diesel engines to produce some extra energy. So actually, if you look at the actual cost of energy, this would fluctuate. And so the question is, what if the provider would give this different pricing the provider has to pay for if you would forward it to the consumer. Of course, it would mean that as a consumer, you would have to look to, the, to some meter telling you the current price. And to decide if you want to put something on or off, you always have to look, is this the current price? This would be a lot of effort. That's the reason why it is not done yet. But if you have some IT solutions that do it for you and try to optimize uh, your energy cons consumption, uh, according to the current real market price, what would be the outcome? And this was part of the simulation we implemented here. So we assumed that we have a real-time energy market. So the price depends on the, uh, on the current uh, production uh, mm -hmm. and the demand. And the consumer can decide either to buy now or probably to turn off or delay the start of some, some device to a later time and buy later. How much energy can you save? How much money can you save by this? And this was some, some case study we modeled here. And this brings me to the next topic, which is smart microgrids. So why do we talk about smart microgrids nowadays? So we had more or less the same electricity system depending on what you count as innovation and what not for like 50 or 150 years, something around this, this time frame. So many things have not changed in this time. But why now changing it? So the reason for this is that uh, until now we had a relatively few number of central power plants that were generating the energy for a large number of consumers. And uh, these economies of scale, they start to fail for the central plants, be plants because it means you have to generate energy somehow, transport it over a long uh, transmission range, which means you have to have the capacity of the transmission. You're also losing a lot of energy on the transmission. And uh, luckily, we have now access also to alternative energy generation. So like photovoltaic panels, they get more and more used. They are, uh, they left the experimental stadium uh, long ago. So, I don't know, somebody has already a, a photovoltaic 
power plant on his or her house? Not yet? Let's ask again in like two years. <laughs> Probably some hands will be raised then. Now this is what, what is coming. So we will have uh, a lot of uh, alternative energy product producers. But those won't be power plants. So a power plant with like a million solar panels producing energy like uh, uh, a standard power plant was before. This is not going to happen. What we will have is we have some solar panels on one house, some solar panels on another house. So we have it much more distributed. And we don't want to increase the, the capacity of the transmission lines even more to be able to send all the energy uh, across the country because this is, this is very expensive. Another reason is, uh, I would say, the, the electricity supply here in this area is uh, quite dependent, so it's quite reliable, but still we had a few power outages every now and then. And our researchers are running a lot of important simulations on our servers. And sometimes the outage is so long that the server has to shut down and probably a simulation cannot finish and uh, the data is even lost because it cannot be restarted or something. So uh, we might be interesting in having something where we don't have a single grid, but we have more reliability against faults, more independence. So if you have your own system and usually you're providing energy and probably giving it back to the market if you have more, but once there is a power outage, you keep it for yourself, you can run your most important services still, still on and you don't lose your simulation results. Or probably if you're not a researcher, you don't lose your simulation results, but probably you can still watch the soccer finals. And another thing is uh, having it more distributed might be also increase the security against targeted attacks. So imagine someone is able to hack into a power plant and take it down. This would cause a lot of outage, but the most important services could be kept if the system is more distributed. And there's also uh, the cost for maintaining the infrastructure. So currently, when you design some power transmission lines, uh, it is calculated what is the maximum amount of energy that could be consumed over this transmission line. There is a, a factor uh, where I can assume it's not more than this at the same time, but still this is a constant factor. And for some situations there might be more, uh, there might be really a very high uh, need for, for transmission of power. And this makes it very, this inflexible approach makes it very costly to <coughs> maintain the grid infrastructure as, as it is now. And when you have it more distributed, more smart, we can we might be able to reduce this and reduce this cost. And in the end, hopefully not only the companies get more revenue out of it, but also the consumer pays uh, a lesser price for the energy. And now we have the technology to, to do this. Yeah? Mm, why is this curve flatten, flattening there towards 2009 or something? <coughs> I'm... Calgary, yeah, I think this is... Uh, this is just an issue of measuring because I think when this, this graph was taken, not everything from 2009 was taken into account. Also, when you look at, at newer projections, they still go on. So. And basically, what's important here is that you see that the renewable energy is more and more increasing. It's taking more and more part of it. And also, this one here is nuclear energy. And you see it ends here in 2009. I'm sorry for this that I have an, an old graph, but you remember what happened? Was it 2010 or when was it Japan? Fukushima. Yeah, 2011. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Japan, Fukushima. Uh, there was a big problem with nuclear power plant due to a, a big catastrophe and Japan uh, took down all their uh, nuclear power plants for several months. And also Germany now decided on their 
uh, on the strategy, how long to keep the nuclear energy. So this is about to diminish. For Austria, this is not a appropriate plot because we don't have nuclear power plants. But in overall, so renewable energy will increase, but this will be distributed. So we have somehow to come up with ideas what we do now with this new situation. But luckily, we have not the technology. With the IT solutions, with the technology uh, we have now, we can overcome these problems. But this means we have a lot of problems to solve. And one approach to that would fit in into this new situation would be smart microgrids. So what does microgrid mean? It means that you consider probably your company or your household, or it could be also some area like this park here, or one building here in this park, as an independent grid where you have your own power generation, could be photovoltaic, could be wind energy, uh, could be also uh, some non-renewable but still uh, autonomous uh, generating like a diesel generator or something. And then you generate here locally. You also have to consider what's the, what's the cost for this or what do you get if you, like, if you use the diesel engine? Does it pay off to use it? Or is it better to tell the researchers they have to do the work again? Depends what the researchers cost. And in this network, uh, also one important thing would be an energy storage, because at some point in time, like the solar uh, plants in the morning and the and start noon, also they produce a lot of energy. But also to quote the example of the researchers, they might prefer to work at night. So which means we have to uh, we have somehow have to move some of our energy production or align our some of our energy production in the morning to some consumption in the evening. So we need some storage for this. Another way is to try to tell my devices uh, to take uh, this into account. So I could have a smart device, for example, some, okay, this is not for a private household, like a washing machine or something, which I could tell wash when I really have the energy as a surplus. And probably don't wash when I'm anyway uh, in very much need for, for energy and I would have to buy it from outside. But not all of your devices will be smart. Because in any case, you will have still a lot of uh, legacy devices which don't have this feature. So somehow your smart grid must be able to integrate this smart device behavior with some legacy devices uh, and be able to manage this in a way that we probably can minimize the amount of energy which is bought or sold uh, from the uh, standard grid. Another way would be if your neighbor has also a microgrid, you could also decide to trade with your neighbor. Because here you have to pay also for the net transmission. And this transmission fee is considerable. If you do it with a neighbor, you have almost no transmission losses. So you might be able to help out your neighbor. Instead of uh, borrowing some milk, you go to your neighbor and borrowing some kilowatt hours. This is the idea of the smart microgrid. And of course, if you think from the legal perspective, from the technology, uh, from the market models, from the stability of the system, there are a lot of issues to solve for this. But this is some idea to transform our energy systems, our consumers, into a network of smart microgrids. Where do you draw the border around the microgrid? Uh, I did it here with this shaded area. Ah, okay. Uh, logically, what is part of the smart grid? What is not part? Uh, what is part of the microgrid? What is not part of the microgrid? What is the overlaying grid and stuff like this? Uh, yeah, in this case, we decide we have the the grid outside. Also, we consider that this microgrid might also be able to work in island mode. So there could be a disconnection here, and it's still operable. Probably at a reduced level of service, but yeah. still operable. So this defines the border here. What's the next network microgrid? Which layer in the grid is that? Or is there a layer or is there a logic? 
Well, I would say yes, in this case it is. Yeah, but of course we have to implement it yet for the microgrid. It's not just if you get a uh, photovoltaic uh, generator for your house, you can, uh, that you call it smart microgrid. You still need to design the system in order to install these borders yeah. and to look what we have inside, what we have outside. But the microgrid, is that your house that you control all the consumption and maybe also generation and storage in there? Or is it an entire neighborhood? Is it an entire city? This is depends how you design the system. You can do it in all the ways. You can have, for example, if you have uh, an entire neighborhood, you can decide either to have separate smart microgrids, each household would be one, and they are probably interconnected via these neighboring uh, connections. Can you have several microgrids on the same distribution grid? Well, I would say yes. Of course, the legal uh, issues for this have to be thought out yet, but I would say yes, yeah. Yes, but, but probably as a user you want to have both. The supply-demand management has an advantage because in a real-time energy market it would mean that you pay less for your energy and the island mode possibility would mean that you can still have your grid operable at a lower level when there is a, an outage. So we want to have both. But your argument with that it's uh, from an engineering perspective or from a technical perspective, two different uh, problems to, to solve. I totally agree, mm -hmm. but we're currently uh, establishing a smart microgrid lab where we exactly will have this and we had to overcome some, some problems in order to enable this, uh, uh, this possibility to have an island mode smart microgrid as well as a smart microgrid that connects to the uh, to the grid, but it is possible. It's not that easy and you have to overcome and do some tricks, but it is possible. But I totally agree that this is a, a, an interesting and important problem. Um, so, did I get it correctly when you, when, you, when you were talking about self-organization, which way we have small entities which contribute to uh, bigger dynamics? Would you have here the small, smart microgrids in order to, to contribute to the to the, uh, as you call it, high voltage grid. I mean, the smart grid, which is the overall grid within the whole country. <coughs> I mean, uh, how would you, yeah. do you also tackle the question of how to clever or smartly uh, coordinate uh, a grid in the whole country? Because obviously this doesn't apply, or doesn't apply to the whole country. Uh, you can find the, the self-organizing approach, or you can apply the self-organizing approach at different levels. <coughs> so you could look at it at the country level, but this is then is more int interesting for the energy distributor to see how the country and the more or less semi-autonomous regions can be managed. You can look at it and from the perspective of a neighborhood where you say we have several smart microgrids, how should they relate to each other and how should they trade with each other? Or you can go inside a smart microgrid and look at the devices here and also these devices, they have to uh, interact with each other and more or less fight for the energy. Like, uh, for example, if, the, if these devices know 
What is important for the user? Is it more important that the washing machine runs now? Because it's important that the kids in the kindergarten tomorrow have uh, clean clothes. Or is it more important that the television set is still operable? Because today are the finals of the European Championship. This is uh, a difficult question, which one is more important? And we, want, we don't want to have to decide this on our own. We want that the system is smart enough to find out what can be done and which services, which are most important to the users, can be held upright in the, in the case of a power shortage. Or is it even good to buy energy at a time when it is very costly? So not even, we don't even need the shortage. We can use an economic argument to say we want to probably shut down some of the devices here. And this, here again, we have this self-organization. And currently, uh, in our uh, implementation for framework, where we model the problem, we had uh, done this middle problem, where we, have, we say we have several smart microgrids, and those are trying to buy their energy from a global market, and they have some possibility to play, because we assume that they have a storage. So they can decide to buy energy when it's cheap, or to buy no energy when it's very expensive, if they still have enough storage to keep up their demand. But what we don't uh, model so far is some intelligent demand-side management. So we do it currently only with storage, but with demand-side management, again, another level of complexity gets into game. So there are many possibilities to apply this approach here. You had one more question, I think. So. Uh, I think, uh, at least in the European Commission, when we think, or we don't think the operational mode is important to, to make a distinction of the smart grids, and you know, you have even a smart microgrid. So it's not, it's rather architectural, uh, not even voltage level, this is not important, but the architectural layer. It's basically now we have a generation, we have transmission, we have a distribution, three layers until now, classical systems. And now it comes the port layer, which will be uh, below the distribution level. It will be even meshed. So the distribution networks will very likely uh, be changed drastically. Because you will have now a generation from the bottom up, not just top, top down. And uh, obviously, the smart grid uh, microgrids will, as you indicated, will have a various uh, you know, shape. Might be one house one injection point uh, and that's it and you have you optimize within the hand so demand side management on the house level demand side management on the environment or whatever village level or, or, or part of the town level but i'm quite sure that uh, you know a large towns or larger cities well we cannot say that they would belong to a microgrid we have stadtwerke in, in the german uh, distribution uh, system i don't know in the other countries but uh, this is this is typically, I would say, precursor or pre-runner of the microgrid. It's not intelligent, but <laughs> it's not smart, but it, it's a kind of a fourth layer, let's say, <coughs> indicated. So uh, the operational mode, I think, doesn't have to do anything with, with, with the architectural level. And uh, this is the, the, the level that, that we think as, a, as a, let us say, smart microgrids. If you uh, micro, it's the, mm -hmm. it's the emphasis on that's probably, uh, let's say, the way that you're thinking. Mm -hmm. wow. Because w at the end, what we, we, we really have at the moment lack is the lack of regulation. Because we are already pushed at the Commission with questions from the field. Uh, this is a typical a new player that comes into the energy market, which is a uh, uh, so-called energy community. So a, a couple of houses or village gets together and instead of everyone paying the access to the, to, the, to the same transformer actually, from the house to the same transformer into distribution grid, they get together, they pull the resources together, they maybe install a battery, uh, uh, you know, uh, energy storage uh, as a common investment of, 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 of the energy community, and they will be a, a, as, a, as a one entity, basically legal entity, and they will have the internal rules and internal uh, let's say relations and external relations via distribution network. So, 
that's a little bit maybe from our side. Mm -hmm, yeah. I, I totally agree with the view. And, and one thing to solve is also the legal issues. Yeah, so. regulatory we say. There's another question here. Hi. Um, I think you, <coughs> your remark was interesting. You said it's fundamentally completely different if you look into stability of networks versus demand, uh, supply demand management. Can you um, elaborate a little bit on this? Because I think it's very interesting to see where you draw the line exactly. What's the difference? Um, well, you shouldn't draw the line exactly, but there are two different tasks. On the one hand, you have the, um, the uh, kind of um, balancing uh, aspect, so you uh, don't have the real-time aspect, but you have to um, um, get the balance between supply and demand on, well, let's say 50 minutes, um, or it would be one minute. So that's the one area, and of course, um, um, they're very interesting. Uh, that's a very interesting approach. And um, now the second um, question is, uh, how can we get the uh, real-time stability issues in the in the grid um, come close to that area? So if you think of, uh, for example, voltage control or frequency control, um, and then you have to um, have to look what kind of pre-planning techniques um, are appropriate for each task. So there, there is a border. I'm not quite sure where it is, but um, I'm quite sure that um, not every um, approach that is working on the, uh, the first task, that is to um, get the balance um, um, when you when you draw the line um, after 50 minutes um, can be used for uh, the, the second area. But there could be an overlap because I mean, if uh, supply and demand is not matched, then you might get instability. Yes, of course. And um, um, supply demand matching comes close to the uh, second um, part um, as soon as you uh, go down in the, in the time area. Yes. Yeah. Then obviously, you know, the system would. Uh, cuts off, puts you in, in the island because you, you tend to, 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 to uh, stabilize actually distribution network or a wider area and you go in island mode and then you, you, know, you, you do your own balance in the microgrid and then load shedding, no other way. You switch off unnecessary users if you happen to have a hospital and then you might be critical. <laughs> Okay. So one possibility to do research in this area, uh, which we are especially also targeting here, is now these smart appliances, so like the self-organization within the household. Uh, here the, the thing is what communication interfaces to use for the smart appliances. Uh, what processing and decision units you need to implement it. Because here you have a very strong uh, cost uh, uh, factor or the pressure on the costs. Because these are uh, like a coffee machine. Is this a coffee machine? Yeah, this is a coffee machine. Uh, they need to be very uh, uh, tightly calculated in their price in order to be able to, to be bought on the market, sold on the market. So under these constraints, you have to solve these problems. Another possibility is to detach it from the device itself and to have the smart plug concept. To just say, OK, you just install some device here, where you usually put in your power plug. You have some device in between that monitors the operation of a device and it is able to shut off a, a device if necessary. Uh, you can create a lot of smart plugs. You can uh, use them for all your devices, but the problem is they don't know about the device condition. So probably the device can run in two modes, in a reduced mode uh, to save energy or in a full power mode. And this information you can do with a smart appliance concept, but you cannot do it with a smart plug concept. And, yeah, and then of course you need some intelligent control uh, that decides what like the, the example of the television set that learns that right now this game is really important because you had a lot of friends coming over and you don't want to lose this. But perhaps the fridge can be a little bit uh, turned down. Also, no, no, because if you're watching the finals with your friends, you don't want the fridge to be not as cool because it's also important for the beer. So 
you see sometimes things are interconnected. And here you need some, some, uh, some intelligent control that learns this because you don't want to program this as a user. Yeah? I think it's in the fridge down. The beer is out of the fridge. You don't want the beer to stay in the fridge, do you? Your friends are out. Yeah. Uh, also, I think and it might not apply for, in, for England because there the beer is drinking warm, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, one approach for these uh, smart appliances we're proposing is that uh, we might never get all vendors to one table to agree on one standard how to implement an interface for controlling smart devices. Because there are so many vendors and so many different era areas. So, we will always end up with a lot of different vendors for a lot of different applications. So, here we have a real zoo of appliances and we cannot do anything about it. And on the other hand, on the used hardware and communication systems, we also might not be able to say it must be this chip that is implemented in each device, or it must be this hardware used, or this plug. Because also, for some applications, you might need some more processing power, so you have a more expensive chip. For some applications, you just want the cheapest, smallest chip available that there is. You need more or less uh, communication, like for a television set you want to have uh, high bandwidth communication. For a coffee machine you don't need it at all. So we also have a, a lot of possible solutions here. And our idea is to apply this hourglass model, similarized internet, to have here in the waste a very slim number of services that can be uh, defined and used and which makes it uh, easier to connect some devices via very different communication systems, but still we have the sim single call systems. So this is also, s there is a, is a paper on this where there is more information. I don't want to go into detail on this issue, but this is also for the smart appliances, uh, some approach we follow. It's related to the smart transducer concept, which comes from automation. We also have the integration of uh, some levels like the sensor actuator, or in our case, the actual appliance thing, some local intelligence, and then some network interface. Just briefly go for this. You need some uh, architecture to maintain, maintain and configure it, and it should be more or less like auto configuration. So you buy a new device for your household, you connect it, and the device might be intelligent, but you don't want now to get to some setup page and tell this device is this and it's important for me or uh, who is using it, no way. Should be a system that plug and play and also a system that learns about the semantics of the device. This is also a big challenge. So the idea is that we go for self-organizing smart devices and we have a, a project there. I can erase this line here. It's not currently under evaluation. It is funded. <laughs> so we have this project Monogy, uh, where we go for these uh, ideas of smart appliances and measuring things. And one other thing we're doing is we are establishing a smart microgrid lab here, which is a place where students can, uh, uh, can be educated in, in this uh, and do experiments in this smart microgrid area. And the smart microgrid lab itself is also a smart microgrid. So it has a photovoltaic uh, power generation unit. It has uh, a battery, uh, uh, several batteries where it can store energy. It has some intelligent controllers in order to uh, manage the energy consumption. So this is where, and here I have several PhD students working on this topic. And it's also so a thought that we integrate our master and bachelor studi students here. And, yeah, I, I will skip over this. We can talk about it in uh, probably in the, in the coffee break, more if interesting. One thing is we are working on non-intrusive load monitoring. This is important if you want to detect devices which are not smart, which are legacy devices. This is a way to do this. Uh, another thing is we are... Uh, uh, working on some modeling and simulation of smart microgrids. Uh, 
So this simulator is also important if you want, we need a simulation of the system if you want to evolve the agent's behaviors for it. So here we're working on a simulator where you can do experiments and, and learn some behavior without actually tapping the real grid because this is dangerous. And we are also into applying, as it is with evolutionary algorithms, applying bio-inspired uh, algorithms. So we're looking how bio-inspired algorithms can be used for... Uh, one thing is we did some work here on uh, bio-inspired information distribution based on a hormone model. And this, for example, can be used to uh, transmit information about prices or auctions throughout the network. And we expect using this approach it becomes more stable instead with a traditional method where you might have a lot of feedback loops that might become, might get the system to become unstable. And here we can add some dampening because nature has already solved these problems. Most cases. There is, for ants, there is some case where ants can get trapped in running in circles until they die. So sometimes nature also fails, but many cases they. So, what are our goals? So may our be me or my group or we all, I think we mostly agree on these things. For me, I would look forward to find topics for collaboration on the self-organizing smart microgrids. But I would be also very interested in discuss with you about the evolutionary design of self-organizing systems. So if you are interested in this topic. And possibilities could be just, uh, uh, just merely exchange of ideas or joint work or working towards joint publication. Uh, we could exchange students and send them across the world. They liked it to see other places. Uh, we also have a possibility to invite guest researchers. So if you like this place here and you think it might be nice here to work here for a few weeks, we have possibility for this. Please contact me on this issue. And of course, joint project proposals. So a big goal would be to work out with an idea for an FP7 project at the end of this work week. And yeah, I'm looking forward to a to further great and fruitful workshop. So, thank you.